Well, good morning again, Lindsley Avenue. I appreciate the opportunity to have a few moments today to share some thoughts with you. And the topic I want to discuss here this morning, I think, is a very important topic. It's a very important topic because it really should focus us on our hearts. And the idea I want to discuss today is the idea of serving others. In particular, the idea of what does it take to be a servant? What do I need to focus on to be a better servant to want to help other people. And I believe we all need to develop the heart of a servant. So come along with me as we look at this here for a few minutes here this morning. I want to look, first of all, at Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 8. When we're thinking about a servant, Jesus is that ideal servant, of course. And in Philippians 2, 5 through 8, we read this. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not think equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. The whole idea of being a servant is to humble yourself and focus needs of others, what we can do for others. Jesus humbled himself, became obedient even to the point of dying in order to serve you and me. So let's take a look at what the basic problem is then for why I am not a better servant, why you may not be the best servant possible. Generally speaking though, however, what's the problem? Why aren't people better servants in looking to help other people? What's the basic problem? Well, for that, let's look at Matthew chapter 20. It's in verses 20 through 29, but Matthew chapter 20. Here's what we read. Then the mother of the sons of Zebedee came up to him, Jesus, with her sons, and kneeling before him, asked him for something. And he said to her, what do you want? She said to him, say that these two sons of mine are to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, in your kingdom. Matthew 20. In the previous chapter, toward the end of Matthew 19, Jesus had said that the disciples would sit on 12 thrones. The disciples may have taken this very literally. You know, most of the time, when the disciples misunderstand something Jesus has said to them, if you look at the text, they misunderstand it because they go to the literal meaning of what Jesus said. Time and again, you can imagine Jesus shaking his head at them saying, you missed the whole point because they went completely literally sit on 12 thrones. There would have to be a throne on either side of Jesus. The mother of the sons of Zebedee, the mother of James and John, comes to Jesus and says, hey, let me ask you, please put my two sons on either side of you so they will be your number one and your number two. And when the ten heard it, you know, you don't do something like that. You don't come and make a request of Jesus and it stays quiet. The other ten disciples, the other ten who would become the apostles, hear what has been done. Hear what James and John's mother has asked for. When the ten heard it, they were indignant at the two brothers. But Jesus called them to him and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. It shall not be so among you, Jesus tells the twelve. So word had spread. The ten field, James and John, had taken advantage of their relationship to Jesus. They're trying to sneak around the, the way it ought to be. They're trying to get something special, and the ten don't like it. The other disciples are really upset, but when you look at Jesus' reaction, he doesn't say, yes, don't be like James and John, or don't be like their mother in coming to ask for this. He says to all of them. Jesus' reaction seems to suggest he's upset because all twelve of them really want a position of power and respect. Maybe they are upset because they didn't ask soon enough. Maybe they are upset that they didn't allow, uh, James and John and their, his mo their mother did not allow Jesus to come to the decision that I deserve to be at the right hand of Jesus. Hey, I want to be the one in a position of power. I'm not going to be very happy if one of these two is in a position of power. They all want a position of power and respect exercising authority, the whole idea of lorded over them that Jesus used in the text up at the top. 
literally means to play the tyrant, be a dictator. And when you think about it, that is all too easy. Give someone a little power and so often it rushes to their head. It makes one feel important to be ordering other people around. Jesus says, that's not how it's supposed to be among you. It shall not be so among you, Jesus told him. Look what he says next. But whoever would be great among you, notice that Jesus does not condemn a desire to become great. The question is going to be, what is great? A desire to be great is not in and of itself a bad thing here at all. Greatness is not a bad thing in and of itself. It shall not be so among you, but whoever would be great among you must be your servant. Servant, the word for servant here is diakonos. It's where we get the word deacon. And it probably comes from two words in the Greek. Apparently in the past, Greek uh, language combined two words, which meant to raise the dust by hurrying. Really, it's, it's almost a roadrunner idea. If you think about the cartoon, roadrunner. You're standing here, you see something that needs to be done, and boom, boom, you know, like the roadrunner with his, with his tongue. You take off to be over there taking care of what needed to happen. What's left behind you? A cloud of dust. A cloud of dust. To be a servant, you've got to be in movement. You've got to be in motion. You've got to be leaving a cloud of dust behind because you saw something that needed to be done. And rather than wondering, well, I wonder who's going to do that or should I go do that? Should I ask somebody about that? We need to get on our feet and get moving to take care of what needs to be done. To raise the dust by hurrying is what the word servant, diakonos, means here. To be great, you want to be great? Be in a hurry to help when help is needed. Be in a hurry to help other people. Be in a hurry to get things done rather than kicking back and relaxing. Whoever would be great among you must be your servant, Jesus said. So what does it mean to be a servant? Whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be your slave. Slave is the word doulos, a bond servant. You know, sometimes if we think of servant, we think of uh, Downton Abbey or something, where you've got someone who's a servant, but they're employed. They get paid or they get room and board, and if they don't like it, they could conceivably get up and leave. That's not what this is talking about when it says your slave. This is someone who is not free to go. So perhaps it really is from a, whenever you see doulos, whenever you see that word servant many times, you should probably go ahead and assume that it means slave, someone who is not free to go. Whoever would be first among you must be your slave. To be first to be great, you have to surrender yourself and be involved in service to others. Note the contrast to the self-seeking James and John, and likely the other disciples as well. James and John really take it on the chin here, but the reaction of the other ten is not that they are offended. Anyone would dare ask to be sitting beside Jesus when he comes into his kingdom. It's that James and John did it instead of them. The problem of being a servant, the problem we all face in our desire to be a servant or in the call to be a servant is we want to be great and we don't equate that to being a servant. We don't equate that to being a slave to other people. We, we want to be great by being the big shot ourselves. And that's exactly the opposite of what Jesus says greatness means. Whoever would be great among you must be your servant. Whoever would be first among you must be your slave. Even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Think back to Philippians. Jesus, being found in, in the form of God, did not think equality with God was something to be grasped. He already had that equality with God. He is God. And yet... He humbled himself, taking the form of a human and in the likeness of a man gave his life for others. 
when you hear the ransom, the word ransom, it's, used as the, it's the word used to, for the price paid to buy a slave who was then set free. Jesus died so that we might have our freedom, but not the freedom to become great, but the freedom to become a servant. The freedom to become a servant. He paid his, the price of his life for us to have freedom from the slavery we have to sin. That's what Jesus did. That's what it means to be a servant, to be so selfless that the thought of personal greatness does not occur to us. What does occur to us is being a servant and being a slave to help other people. The world may assess a person's greatness by the number of people that they control or the number of people who are at their beck and call or by their intellectual standing or academic eminence or by the number of committees of which they are a member, or by the size of the bank balance or the material possessions that they've amassed. I mean, think about it. You can look at American culture. Greatness sure seems to be equated to one of those kind of aspects of a person's life. But in the assessment of Jesus Christ, those things are irrelevant. They do not matter. They are not what makes a person great. So what does? Jesus' assessment is quite simply, how many people have you helped? You want to be great? Be a servant. Help other people. That's how you achieve greatness. And that's why it often is so difficult for us, because we don't want to quit thinking of ourselves. Our three most important people, favorite people, are me, myself, and I. They're at the top three of the list. I want to be great. I want to have people serving me. That's what it means to be great, having huge houses and all sorts of money and people coming to help you. That's what it means to be great, and we are so confused by that mistaken idea. We don't recognize so often. It's a hard thing to learn to be great. I need to be the servant of other people. 1 Peter 4, 10 and 11, I think is a very good passage to look at when it, we want to think about being a servant. Look what it says, 1 Peter 4, 10 through 11. Peter says, as each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Whoever serves is one who serves by the strength that God supplies in order that in everything, God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. Let's take a closer look at that passage. If you want to be a good servant, this is really your, your prime call here in terms of a text. 1 Peter 4, 10 through 11. He says, as each has received a gift, God gave gifts to men and to women, Ephesians 4. But we haven't all received the same gift. You think of the parable of the talents. Some individuals are given five talents, some two, some one. Some people have the gift or talent of speaking in front of groups of people. Some people have the talent of teaching little children. That's a talent I really struggle with. I'm really not very good at that. Some people have the talent of making money and being generous to help the cause and to help other people. Some people have the talent of simply being a friendly ear and someone who can help people when they're struggling. We all have a different talent. But whatever talent we have received, whatever gift God has given you, whatever gift God has given me, is not to be used to make myself look great in the eyes of the world. Look what Peter says. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace, of the various gifts and grace that God has given to each of us. Be a good steward of it and use whatever gift God has given us, and he has given each of us a gift. The passage does say each of us has received some sort of gift. We have some sort of talent. I need to identify what that talent is and use it to serve one another. It's a similar thought to Romans 12, verse 6. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. If you remember in the parable of the talents, the only servant that really got the master upset is the one who didn't do anything with the talent he had been given. 
One servant had taken the talents of five and turned them into five more, one two into two more. The only servant that the master, Jesus, in the parable got mad at is the one that didn't do anything with them. Having gifts that differ, let us use them. The only way to use them is to try to identify what gift have I been given? What can I do that helps other people? Again, can I speak? Can I teach? Can I help people? Can I be empathetic and sympathetic with people? Can I always reach out to people who have lost loved ones? Whatever the gift is, use it to serve other people. Whoever serves is one who serves by the strength that God supplies. The ability to serve and the strength needed to serve come from God. They don't come from each of us. You know, in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. The point of our service is to glorify God, not to glorify ourselves. The purpose of serving. The purpose, the reason we serve other people is to glorify God, not ourselves. Peter says that if a Christian is engaged in practical service, we have to render that service in the strength which God supplies. It is as if he said, when you are engaged in Christian service, you must not do it as if you were conferring a personal favor or distributing bounty from your own store, but in the consciousness that we give what we first received from God. You ever been around somebody that seemed to make you feel like they were doing you a favor merely by allowing you in their presence? Or, well, I suppose I can part with this. Here you go. Here's a little trifle. I mean, even the idea of a trifle is something tiny. That's not the way it's supposed to be. Preaching is not done to display the preacher but to bring men, to bring women face to face with God and His message as to what He requires of us. Service is not rendered to bring prestige to the giver, but to turn people toward God. Why are you doing this? Why are you helping me? Because God loves you just like He loves me. And because of that, I love and care about you and want to help. That's why. Why we serve others. And that's the importance of serving others is so that God may be glorified in everything that we do. Now there are some easy ways to serve. You could have a whole series of sermons and classes on looking into the New Testament for examples and ways that we can bring service. Here are two such, such simple ways to serve. I want to talk about those here for just a minute. One easy way to serve people, even in an era of social distancing, is to pray for other people. To remember people and their faith and to pray that they won't struggle with their faith in a time of challenge. To encourage people to avoid evil, pray for others. Pray for others if they are in trouble, if they're facing some kind of stress or trial in their life. Pray for others if they're sick, and that is happening, of course, not only as we age, but in this time of the pandemic. Pray for people if they're sick. Pray for people if they are newly married. People who are newly married have a very vast adjustment to make. Pray for newly married people. Pray for people who have been married a long time. Pray that they don't get aggravated with each other because of the close quarters that they have had for so many years. Pray for people who are married. Pray for people who are single. You get the common theme here? Pray for people. Pray for people. Pray for people if they are newly baptized. That's when the devil comes after people the hardest. Pray that they will grow in their faith for God, their love for God, and their love for other people. Pray if people are facing a challenge. Pray for others. The Lindsley Avenue News that's sent out, the email lists people who have special needs. Pray for people. Stay in contact with people, whether it's through social media, whether it's through a text, whatever it is. Stay connected so that we know people well enough to know what problems they're facing. And look, pray for other people. That's such an easy way to serve And it glorifies God because we are taking the names of brothers and sisters before His throne in prayer. 
Don't forget to pray for elders and deacons, new parents, older people, as well as President Trump, Vice President Biden, the Congress, the governor, etc. Pray for people regardless of the political party they're in. Pray for people whether you wanted to vote for that person or not. It does not matter. We are to pray for kings and people in positions of authority. An election's coming. Let's pray not so much that our person wins, but let's pray that the person who wins will enable us to live a quiet, peaceable life and be able to do God's work here on the earth. I've never been convinced that God is nearly as concerned with tax policy that a country might have as he is for whether you and I are actively involved in the lives of people. That's what you pray for. That's what you pray for. Obtain materials you need to pray for people in need. Look for the emails. Look for the lists of names of people, missionaries, people who are hurting, people who need help, and pray for them. I'm going to ask you to pray for people in the email list at least twice this week. It's not a hard, uh, wrong thing at all to pray for them every day. But focus on praying for people this week. If you do it long enough, it'll become a habit if you're not already doing it. And pray for people this week. Another easy thing to do is to help the sick. Help the sick. Matthew 25, verse 36. Jesus said to the people on Judgment Day, I was sick and you visited me. That doesn't mean that they came by a hospital room. The whole idea of visit is they cared for this person, cared for Jesus when he was sick. And they said, when did we see you, Jesus, sick? You didn't see me. When you saw other people sick and you took care of them, you were doing it to me. I was sick and you visited me. So how can you help the sick? Well, look at the reason and the way we help other people from 2 Corinthians 1, verses 3 through 4. Paul says here, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. Where does comfort come from? It comes from God. And God comforts us in our affliction. We're so thankful of that. Why does he comfort us? Look at the text. The Father of mercies, the God of all comfort, who comforts us in our affliction. Why? so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. God is the Father of mercies, the God of all comfort. He comforts us so that we will be able to comfort others who need help when they are sick or facing trials. God comforts me so that I will be prepared to comfort other people. That's a passage we need to look at more often. Anytime we are comforted, anytime we are having a problem and we receive help, the reason we receive help is to pass it on and to help other people. So how can I help the sick? Easy, easy things here as well. Visit them while in the hospital if you can. Help them with an errand while they're in the hospital. Do they need their grass cut, their mail picked up? What do they need? What can they not do when they're sick in the hospital that we might could do for them to help out? Visit them when they're at home. Many times you get out of the hospital and you're isolated. Visit people when they're at home. Help with errands or things they need around the house once they are home. It doesn't have to be when they're in the hospital. These days people can become quarantined. I don't recommend you go into a house of someone who's quarantined in case they are actually a victim of the pandemic, but they're going to need things. Help them out. Order groceries and have groceries delivered to their house. I mean, there are all sorts of ways to help people who are sick or not feeling well. Take food to them and their families at home. Hospital communion if they're in the hospital or communion so they can uh, uh, observe the Lord's Supper when they're at home. Pray for them. We just said that is number one. Here you get double credit for it. It can be helping the sick and praying for other people. Send cards to people who are sick. My dad has been at home uh, recovering from a stroke for some time. He has a stack of cards he has received. And you know what? When I go over there and see him, he always shows me, look at this. It's a demonstration. He, he, I'm sure he's looking at it saying, people cared enough about me to take the time to send me a card. We think, ah, it's just a card. The person that gets 20, 30, 40, 50 of them, it's a lot more than just a card. 
How will you help the sick? Being mindful of social distancing. None of this should be taken to mean violate social distancing, put people who are recovering potentially from something they were, they were facing at risk of contracting COVID? No, 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 no. Don't do that. You can do so many of these things and still be mindful of social distancing. How can I help the sick? These are just two of dozens of things that we can do to serve other people. If, if I put other people in first place ahead of myself. If I have the heart of a servant, look at Philippians 2. Jesus humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. He became flesh and dwelt among us. He freely gave his life so that we might be reconciled to God and become a member of God's family. He wants us to be servants, but the only way we can do that is not to look to make ourselves great. So here's the question of the day. It's a familiar question. I say this a lot. Are you, am I, living for myself? Am I focused on trying to be great myself and have things done for me? Or am I living for God? And the best way so many times to see which way I'm living, whether it's for myself or living for God, is by what my day looks like and whether I am more focused on helping other people or looking to have people help me. Which is it for you? I ask myself that question a lot because it's a very difficult question and a difficult place to keep a focus on helping other people. I have to have the heart of a servant. The choice is yours. If you're not yet a member of God's family, that is by far the first choice you need to make. You need to understand that Jesus came and died for you to pay the price for all the wrong things you had done in your life, just like he died for me and all the wrong things I had done in my life. I need to turn my life around, repent, and focus on God instead of myself and leave all those wrong things behind, confess him before people, and be buried in water in order to be raised to walk in newness of life, to be baptized. So if you're not yet a member of God's family, become one today. There are people all over who will find a way to get to you, even in an age of isolation, and help you become a member of God's family. If you're already a member of God's family, am I living for myself? Am I living for God? Please, please think about that question today. In Acts chapter 20, we read that when Paul was at Troas, the disciples came together in order to break bread. It then says Paul went on and preached. But the reason they gathered together, Acts 20 verse 7, was for the purpose of breaking bread, to observe the Lord's Supper, to commune with each other, and to have that sharing, that communion vertically with God. We still do that today. Because as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we, pro we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Jesus died for you and he died for me. His body was given so that we would have the forgiveness of sins. As we are about to partake of that bread, we need to focus on the fact that Jesus gave himself for us. Let's have a prayer for the bread. Father, we are so thankful that you loved us enough, even when we were sinners, that you sent Jesus to die so that we would have the opportunity to live with you. And as we remember the suffering, the hanging on the cross, the death of Jesus, and as we partake of this bread, which is to represent his body, we would ask that we would pledge that our lives will focus more on living for you and serving others than they have in the previous week. Thank you again, Father, for the gift of your Son, and thank you for this bread to help us remember his body. It is through your Son's name we pray. Amen.
The New Testament tells us that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission, no forgiveness of sins. Jesus shed his blood on the cross so that we would have our sins forgiven by becoming members of God's family. As we are about to partake of this fruit of the vine, which Jesus instituted as a memorial, a memory for his blood, let's focus on the shedding of his blood, the giving of his life, which allows us to have life. Would you pray with me, please? Father, again, we are so thankful for the gift of your Son, and we are thankful that he gave himself on the cross, that he shed his blood for us. As we partake of this cup, help us to examine ourselves to make sure that we are living the way we should with our focus on you and not on ourselves. And again, we are thankful for this fruit of the vine that represents Jesus' blood and gives us the hope of eternal life. Through your Son we pray. Amen. We are not gathered together in order to give as we usually do, but the commandment to be a cheerful giver and to give as we have been prospered still remains. And so as you hopefully have purposed in your heart to give, let us give generously and let us continue to be generous with what we have been given in order to open up the glory of God here on the earth. Would you pray with me, please? Father, you have blessed us so incredibly here in America and here in this town, and you have given us so many things. Everything we have comes from you. Help us to have a heart of a servant and a heart that's generous to give as you have prospered us so that we can take your word to other people and so that we can minister to people who are hurting. Help us to always give with a smile and a generous heart. Through your Son we pray. Amen.